99% of jobs, that's what's going to allow us to do business together. It's not going to be the price. It's not going to be the fact that somebody can dig it up and we're not going to dig it up. It's what is the pain point? What's the disruption to you in your business or your house or your family? And how much can we ease the pain of the fixing process? Yeah. Welcome to the Royal Flush Podcast. My name is John Overy. I am the VP of Sales here at Royal Flush. In this podcast, we cover the ins and outs of our ever-growing state-of-the-art epoxy pipelining company. In this episode, we talk with my partner and brother-in-law, Mark Watson, about Pipelining 101. We give you the 10,000-foot view of what pipelining is, some of the terms and technology that we use, the process we go through on almost every single project, and try to give you a simplified version so you can better understand what it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and what actually pipelining is. So stay tuned, have a listen. I think you're going to love it. Mark, welcome back. That is going to be called the Mark Seat for now on, by the way. That works for me. Um, in this episode, we are going to cover what I like to call Pipelining 101. Okay. So uh, obviously, you've heard me say millions of times that 99% of people don't know what we do. Right. And even within the trades, we have other plumbers, other contractors, excavation contractors, anybody who's handy, 99% of those people don't even know what we do. And so whenever we explain to somebody hey, here's what pipelining is. We can do it in like this really short one minute span, but of course that doesn't cover all the th millions of things that encompass a project. So what I really wanna do is talk about some like our versions of definitions, what pipelining is, what it does, why it's beneficial, and then really go into like the four or five steps of what it is that we actually do. So if I'm uh, you know, Uncle Bob and I own a property, and you have me on the phone or in person for five minutes, and I say, Mark, what the hell is pipelining? Tell me what you're going to tell them. So, um, all right, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, pipelining is a way of making a repair to a sewer line or a drain pipe without having to dig it. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what I explain to people more in layman's term is essentially we're putting a pipe within that pipe. Mm -hmm. So we are inserting a sleeve, adding some air pressure to it, carrying it with our UV method, and that is it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people tend to understand the analogy I usually give about, you know, like a doctor puts a stent in a heart. Yes. Whenever we talk to somebody in the medical field, they get it. They really get it. So tell me what right. that's more about. So basically, you know, you just explain to them, hey, listen, you know, we're, you know, we're pushing a balloon inside the pipe. We're airing it up, letting it cure and def deflating the balloon. And now it's all set. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people understand it that way versus, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, really, if, if I said to you, I'm going to invert a liner at 8 PSI, and yeah. this, they're not really going to get yep. it. Resins and this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. Um, and I agree. I think that's the simplest way to do, to do it. What I, what I say to people is we're going to uh, basically put a new pipe inside your old pipe. And if they want to get into detail, that new pipe is a felt tube sock right. that we put a really cool liquid epoxy, right? And I try to do things that are are uh, people might understand. So like, hey, have you ever had your garage floor epoxy? Or right. you and I love those um, epoxy coffee tables and exactly. stuff like that, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen those? So this is kind of this cool, clear liquid epoxy. We're going to put it in the pipe. We're going to blow it up so it takes all those turns and crevices and glues to the edge of the pipe. Right. And then we use the coolest state-of-the-art technology within our industry, which is ultraviolet light to harden it. Right. And that one right there, you go with the, uh, you've either had some dental work done, they mm -hmm. use that blue light, or, you know, the women out there, they get the manicures or pedicures and they use the blue light to cure it. They tend to really grasp it that way. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And so that blue light is going to have an instant chemical reaction with that epoxy and turn it to a rock. Right. And thus, your new pipe inside your old pipe. Right. Exactly. So if this is the new fancy way to fix a pipe underground, what's the traditional old fashioned way that 99% of people might recommend or do? that we really don't do. So dig and replace is typically that method, mm -hmm. which again, there's a time and a place for everything. Yeah. Um, some guys will dig and replace the entire sewer line and other guys will only dig and replace the bad areas. Yep. Um, the problem I have with that is that you're only addressing one section. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So a lot of times people go and do what they call a spot repair. So they'll yeah. dig down, replace two foot section and then on the way. But now by removing that one bad joint that had roots in it, you actually essentially created two more bad, two more possible joint areas mm -hmm. where the, the fern codes are put on or the four bands are put on, you know, what may end up settling or poor com compaction if they don't do it correctly over time. Yep. Um, now again, digging and replacing, I mean, if, if your pipe is, if your sewer line is two feet deep in your backyard, hand dig and replace it. Yeah, and it's, and it's dirt and you've got no beautiful grass, no patio, no deck, no flowers, and you don't care what the ground is. Exactly. It's gonna be significantly cheaper right. to dig and replace it. Right, 
And there's a time and a place for it. You mm -hmm. know, like that's why like with our method, there's absolutely a time and a place. Yeah. If you have a hospital and it's running down the main corridor and there's rooms and there's still patients and it's active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give me the clean out. Let me do my job from there. Yep. Um, but again, you know, front yard, backyard where you got grass, you're not really over concerned about it. It's not a paver patio. It's not a concrete. It's not a porch. It's not whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, there's dig and replace methods for that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So when we talk about the benefits, um, I'll tell you, I'll say a benefit and you tell me how we really convey that to a customer when we're, we're saying, Hey, you know, maybe Bob knew about, you know, I had a, a pipe replaced 10 years ago, another property, and we're talking to him this today with our solution what the benefit's gonna be real value. So the number one benefit we always try to say is lack of disruption, right. right? And so tell me what that means. So of course, so lack of disruption. So even if it is in your grass, but we're down at eight feet, right? Mm -hmm. So now you've got your yard being torn up if you're digging it. Um, you know, you're putting plywood down, obviously, to try and keep it as clean as possible. But again, now you're going to have to worry about what's growing back there again. You're going to have to seed it and sod it. Is it going to settle a little bit? Because no matter what, earth is going to settle more than what it was originally. Mm -hmm. um, so now you've disrupted all that earth. You've added air to it. And then now you put it back. It's going to settle. Then you've got to worry about topsoil and loom or whatever it may be. Now change that over to lack of disruption. It's running down the middle of your driveway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay, it's going to sound cheaper in the beginning. Hey, I can dig so many feet for, you know, 50%. But now you have to put a driveway back. Then you can't drive on the driveway. You've got mm -hmm. all these other issues. Now it's a patch or you're doing the whole driveway. Yep. Concrete patio, forget it. You know yep. what I mean? You're going to have patches. It's going to be discoloration. Mm -hmm. It's going to look different. Um, and then, again, if lack of disruption, if, if it's running underneath your porch or an addition yep. to your house or, you know, something that can't be moved, yep. how, are you, how are you getting to it? Yeah, I think the perfect marriage of what we do to a customer who has a problem is when, it doesn't make sense to dig because the right. depth, right? Of course. It's too far deep, and that can make that bigger disruption. Or a lot of times on any property, commercial or residential, where the pipe goes isn't just an open field, right? So it's, you know, we'll use just everybody's house. It heads out of the front of your house, and you've got a porch, and your home was built in 1942. Right. That porch has concrete footings. We looked at one yesterday in Providence where they had a concrete set of staircase running out the house, and mm -hmm. right down the middle of the path was a house trap. Yeah, and so, so you can't, I mean, you can, but what's it going to cost you to, to dig and remove concrete steps that were poured in 1937 that are solid concrete? Right. Then you got to go down the eight feet to get to the pipe. Then you got to put the, the steps back. That's probably a four to five day job. Of course. And then the pouring new steps could be two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 right there. Well, of course, yeah. Um, the and, other thing is, too, just to touch on that eight feet thing, it's, it's a safety aspect as well. Mm -hmm. So, like, you, now you have guys on your property that are working down at a crazy depth. Yep, you home. know, you're hoping they have a trench box and they're, you know, maintaining safety, but then you got to worry about, is the ground going to collapse around the house? Mm -hmm. Up here in New England, a lot of the houses have fieldstone foundations. Mm -hmm. So, digging close to one of those, basically, it's just a rock wall. Mm -hmm. You dig too close to those, sometimes you can shift that foundation. There's all these other factors that go into the excavation side that's, you know, the disruption end of it's pretty scary and pretty, you know, unsafe. Yeah, yeah. And then certainly on any commercial projects, the disruption is usually very, very different where a big section of that pipe is inside. Right. Right. And so we've worked in many hospitals, manufacturing plants, just commercial buildings, multifamily apartment complexes where their only option to dig and replace might be to dig up a whole entire apartment unit. Might right. be to dig up a, a floor in a hospital. And as we know, that's not even an option. Right. Right. We're really not even getting to the outside of the building. Very rarely, it's all these issues underneath. So tell me about the value that we're going to you know, perceive to them about the disruption that they're going to take on at something like that. So an in interior of a commercial building, the disruption, I mean, it's time. You know, mm -hmm. we're working, I mean, the other day we worked from an 18 by 18 pit. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your disruption point inside of a bathroom that they could put out of service and still have mm -hmm. the rest of the building you know, undamaged and unscathed. Um, you know, when you're looking at these commercial properties, a lot of the times the piping doesn't necessarily run in the best area. Yeah. I've seen them cut underneath patient rooms. Um, we've had pipes that are underneath x-ray and imaging machines because this piping is all put into these buildings where it originally was laid out, and mm -hmm. then they've gone through five or six remodels in that yep. time frame, and now more expensive stuff is on. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a CAT scan machine costs, but I'm sure it would cost a lot of money to shut it down and move it. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that cost, but how much money they're going to lose while that machine is down. Not being able to offer that service to their customers. Exactly. But now I can fire a liner from a clean out in a closet mm -hmm. and we're all set. We're up and running. Yep. I had a conversation yesterday. We're going to look at the job to today for a restaurant owner. We've done a right. lot of different restaurants. And so the customer and the guy interested, you know, we talked about ballpark pricing and he was a little shocked the ballpark right. I gave him. But I said, listen, it's not about the upfront cost. He was actually digging, replacing a section of line. 
And he realized the pipe was bad and he had what we call the dig and chase method. And he realized that this pipe was heading right underneath all the kitchen equipment for about 50 feet. Right. And that's what spurred him to call us. But when I told him about the number and the disruption, I said, listen, what's it going to cost you to, first of all, just move the equipment out of the way? So now the restaurant shut down. Right. Okay. You're moving all the equipment off to the sides. Then you've got to dig up the entire kitchen floor. Yeah. I go, how, how long is that going to take? Two, three, four days? Right. If, and that's, that's where the could grow in there. Yep. So then you've got to replace the pipe. Now you've got to fill the hole in. You've got to backfill it. There could be settling. You can't have settling inside of a, right. kind of a dip in the floor. You've got to retile the floor. You've got to re-put back all the equipment. I go, how much time and money is that going to cost? I think I told the guy twenty to $30,000. I go, you're talking, you're talking $30,000, $50,000. I go, and on top of that, how much revenue is the restaurant going to lose for your three-week project? Right. Well, we know as just the revenue portion, we know some of the McDonald's we work in. Mm -hmm. Some of them are doing twenty to thirty plus thousand a day. Mm -hmm. So for us to go in there in a four hour period for them is like, whew, yeah. thank God, because they're losing that yep. in in a day. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I try to explain it as the opportunity costs. So we're going to minimize the disruption and we're going to do the job quicker, right? And so what is the opportunity cost? So if somebody gave you a number to you know dig and replace for twenty, and my my number was thirty to line it. That's great, but all the other factors going in, if they're losing five grand a day and that takes a week, right? five times seven, thir that's $35,000. That's so when you put those two things together, I'm actually significantly cheaper in saving you value. So it's the opportunity cost on a project that a lot of people don't understand or don't factor in that we usually have to really, really convey to somebody. Right. And then when you just put, you know, hey, grab a pen, write these numbers down. I'm this, but what's it going to cost for this, 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 and this, and you add it up. That's the lack of disruption in that time piece that we yeah. can offer that people don't understand. But not only that, in this wonderful state of Massachusetts where we do a lot of our work, you're still replacing that pipe with cast iron pipe. Mm -hmm. And some of these guys getting coated pipe is, is difficult for a lot of these guys. Not every supplier stocks it. Mm -hmm. So they're installing these pipes, again, these cast iron. And most restaurants are getting about seven years out of cast iron. If that, yeah. If that. That mm -hmm. soda and that grease is just breaking them down. So now you're looking at, hey, we're in here once. And this yeah. could potentially be it. It's going to design life for 50 years mm -hmm. with the, you know, the materials we use. Yep. Um, show me a piece of cast iron that's going to last 50 years in a restaurant. Mm -mm. Not, not going, going to happen. happen. Nope. Right. Not going to happen. Um, all right. So let's go to the next kind of real benefit that we talk about in its improved flow. And so um, talk to me about some of the flow disruptions that we come across in a cast iron pipe. So cast iron and clay are probably the two most common materials. And so what are the, some of the flow issues in cast iron and what are some of the flow issues in clay? And when we put a liner, how do we tell people or how does it work with an improved flow and actually we tell people your pipe's going to flow better? Right. So in cast iron in particular, that the pipe on the inside is rough. And I always give the analogy, it's, it's like your arteries. I mean, I hope it's not like your arteries. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we know your arteries kind of scale up and get rough on the inside and that you know slows flow down. So when we go in there, we mill it out there with that Pocote equipment we're actually making a gun barrel smooth again. Mm -hmm. um, and then now with that liner, you're actually increasing your flow by 10% because that is entirely smooth on the inside, yep. especially the way we clean it. We're a little OCD about it. We triple double check everything, make sure it's good and clean. But so that flow in that cast iron. And a lot of times we get calls for people that have cast iron pipe and they're like, hey, my plumber or my drain cleaner said I have a belly in the pipe or I have a hole in it or whatever. Sometimes those are false positives, we'll call it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is the, the pockets of scale and rust will actually create what we think is a belly or mm -hmm. create what we think is a hole in that pipe. And after we descale it, essentially 90% of the time, we end up with a nice smooth round pipe mm -hmm. that actually has pitch and has flow. Yep. So a lot of these backups that are being caused in cast iron is because it's so rough and it's catching everything. Mm -hmm. You know, So imagine you go down 95 and there's a backup. You know, There's an accident. Well, guess what? Now you're slowing down because somebody's watching that. And then it's mm -hmm. just that residual effect yep. and it's constantly slowing everything down. Now, when it comes to clay pipe, you essentially have a joint every three to five feet. So those joints tend to settle quite a bit more. So they get a lot of offsetting going. Now, with our liner, it creates a nice smooth line right over that. So that's what's really going to strengthen up those joints in the clay, but also make it smooth. So no papers are getting ca caught. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no solids are getting caught in there. It's literally, I call it the water slide effect. Yes. You want to be able to just write out that drain. Yep. Yeah. So the, again, the analogy of the highway, <laughs> your scale or your nasty stuff built up in the cast iron is a traffic jam, right. right? And your lips and your roots in the clay is a traffic jam. And what that liner is creating is a wide open freeway that's 15 lanes that you can go 100 miles an hour down. Exactly. Right? right. Or a water slide. There's no resistance. There's nothing holding it up. It's allowing it to go from, you know, a toilet and right down to right. the main in the street. 
Yeah, and I mean the thing is too, even on the cast iron, we've had some some foreign objects that are in the cast iron. Now, if they were smooth, they might have went all the way through and not had an issue. You know, we did a school a while back, and it was kids flushing vape pens down there. Obviously, they must be in the bathroom where they're going to get caught by a teacher. Um, but again, if that was a smooth pipe, they 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 mm-hmm. would probably rush right down there. But yeah. now they're hitting these pockets of scale and rust, and they're getting all hung up and caught. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the next big benefits that uh, what we offer and what we do is what we call seamless technology, which is similar and kind of goes with uh, the improved flow. But uh, when somebody's telling me about, go back to the issue when somebody's doing a repair, right? So let me set the scene. If we've got a house and you've got 50 feet from the front of the house out to the connection in the street, and about halfway at 25 feet, the pipe is cracked or a little broken or there's some nasty roots. And somebody goes in and digs a hole and makes a patch and, you know, repairs that two to three foot area. So now right. you've got 25 feet, a little patch, and 22 feet, right? Right. Um, when we talk about seamless technology or the liner is seamless, tell me the issues with that patch and what the liner would solve right. if we didn't do that. So we frame it in multiple scenarios where you'll see that. You'll see a house go from cast iron to a small piece of PVC to clay to maybe even asbestos or whatever it may be. Wherever they've done that repair in the PVC, the guys will use fern coals, they'll use four bands or whatever it may be. But if they're not compacting that soil correctly below it and above it in rifts, what will happen is that section there will actually drop. Mm-hmm. And we see that a lot. And, you know, we've seen it in with even some of the best excavation companies we've worked mm-hmm. with. We've gone in after them. And it, it happens. Ground yep. settles. Um, so with our liner, it goes right through and there's no settling. There's no give, there's no flex, there's no yep. nothing. So literally that liner is creating that one continuous motion all the way through. Mm-hmm. Yep. So again, there's no, there's no going to be, uh, there's not going to be any joints, seams, or cracks like in clay pipe. Right. And there's going to be nothing for it to catch up on uh, cast iron pipe. So again, the one seamless continuous piece. Now, right. we can stop that liner anywhere we want. So if we have 50 feet, we can line 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet. We can, obviously, we want to line the whole entire thing. Right. But... Um, having one continuous piece, again, checking off the list of it and eliminating any future possibilities. We've covered all the gaps in the joints in the seams, so now we have a seamless continuous piece of pipe. And when we have that, that's how we can truly tell you, hey, this is a permanent solution. A root cannot intrude or go through a liner because it's one continuous piece. Right. And essentially what you're doing for the roots, you're cutting off that source of nutrients. Mm-hmm. So roots are very powerful. If you ever walked along a sidewalk, you can see sidewalks lifted or anything like that with trees. So those roots, they sense the water mm-hmm. when there's a when they're clay pipe and they got a joint that they can get into. And they'll send in one little hair like root and then all of a sudden they invite all their buddies and then it's a massive root. Mm-hmm. So by us now putting that sleeve in there, it's not sensing anything. It can't get to it. It's impermeable to the roots. Yep, yeah. And the root I mean roots certainly can go through the physical clay but 99% of the time they're going through the joint or the crack or where they're butted up together, right? right? Yep. And so if there is no joint or crack and it's one seamless piece, the root has nowhere to go. Right. So that's how we can tell you that, hey, we're literally offering you a permanent solution. A permanent solution. Right. And then I think our last benefit that we love that's really easy to talk to people about is the warranty and the lifespan. So tell me about what our warranty is and what how long a liner lasts. So our warranty here is we call it a 10-year Warranty. We warranty it against any blockages or any root intrusion. Mm-hmm. Now that is standard blockages. I mean, if you're in there and you're flushing down foreign objects, you know what I mean, like we talked about earlier, vape pens or anything like that that shouldn't be in there, then that's not that's not really on us. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's typical bathroom usages and all that kind of stuff. We also warranty that no roots are going to permeate it and it's not going to break down and there's not going to be any further issues. Mm-hmm. The design life of the product is 50 years. So that's all through MaxLiner. We provide all that documentation to all of our customers. So that product is actually tested, tried, and true to live up to a 50-year lifespan. Mm-hmm. Um, most materials today are that way. So you know, uh, you know, know, PVC is tested that way. Mm-hmm. So you're getting the same type of product, but it's just in the ground and it's warrantied. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then let's talk about <clears throat> the steps to a job, right? So I think hopefully we've explained kind of big picture and maybe going into a little bit of detail on like what pipelining is, why you might want to do it, what the alternative is, what's the benefit to it. But let's go into detail about what like, th- I think there's four to five standard processes or steps on every single job, right? Mm-hmm. And so the first step of any project is the camera inspection. Of course, And yeah. this is actually the most important part. So tell me, what goes into a camera inspection, why we are cameraing or looking inside that pipe, and what what it is that we're looking to gather and get from that camera inspection. Okay. So what I always say to people is 
the camera inspection is so important. You wouldn't go to a doctor and say, I broke my arm, don't do an x-ray. Do whatever you need to do, but no x-ray. Mm -hmm. Right. So you essentially need to get in there and find out exactly what's going on to see if our solution is even the solution you need. Mm -hmm. um, so by us getting into the house, we do the camera inspection. We can gather multiple pieces of information. So we're going to gather the pipe size and diameter. We're going to get the length of it. We're going to get the materials that are involved in it. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to get what is the actual problem. Mm -hmm. I have looked at projects and said, my solution's not the solution for you. Mm -hmm. It's it's not going to help what's going on here. You have a section of back pitch, you have a belly or whatever mm -hmm. that needs to be dug in place. That yep. happens. But for, so all that information that I'm able to gather, I'm able to gather whether I need to clean it properly, how I'm going to clean it, the timeline I think it's going to take, how many connections come into that pipe that I'm going to have to worry mm -hmm. about. So the camera inspection is, is very critical. Yeah. And to a lot of people, they're like, oh, I already had one done. And we get that all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to A, get my eyes on it. And I want to be able to get my hard measurements from it. Yes. So what we do in our camera inspections is we'll send that camera all the way down that pipe. We'll look at it all the way through. And then when we get to the very end where we think it's appropriate to end that liner at the main, we'll put what we call a tape mark on the camera itself. So literally a piece of electrical tape, colored electrical tape. This way here, after we record it all, we stretch that camera out. That gives us a hard exact measurement of the mm -hmm. liner we're going to be installing. Because yep. a lot of times guys will go off what's on the camera. Mm -hmm. The camera reel can be... Five feet off, six feet off. Miscalibrated, just, right. yeah. And it's, it's happened to get knocked around in the truck, but I don't want to charge you for an extra five feet you don't need. Mm -hmm. So this way here, we give everybody hard measurement from that camera inspection. Yep. And so uh, on my end, I get a lot of people asking for ballpark estimates, right? Right. Because people, again, they don't know what we do. They might have seen a video, a little bit about their misconceptions on the cost online. Right. And so like, oh, you know, hey, I've got this. I've got 50 feet. Well, what's the price? I can give people a pretty generic price. But what I tell them is, we need to assess the logistics of the project. So we're gonna do that with the camera inside the pipe. But as silly as it sounds, we also need to, like we need to physically be there. I need to see can we get our equipment down the stairs? Right. Is there a basement window to run our hoses in? Do we have this wide open basement that's empty, or do we got you know Susie who likes to collect things for the last seventy five years and it's a dungeon down there? Right. These are really important factors that people tend to not think of when we're talking about a price. But we need to be able to physically see the pipe understand we're going to work, how we're going to put our equipment, if we need to dig a, a little hole or not, and then the length, the dimension, the size, right. the condition of the pipe. And the importance of all that stuff. So a lot of times working in these commercial buildings, it's I, I like to do the walkthrough with whoever's in charge, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we worked um, at uh, Miriam Hospital in Providence, and they were like, hey, all right, you guys can run air hose. It was 300 feet of air hose. So now we have to account for that. Yep. Um, well, now we want it clipped to the drop ceiling tile so it's out of everybody's way so it's not a trip, si a trip hazard. So all that, that has took to, two and a half hours. So all that has to get built yeah. in all of our pricing. So if I went in there and said, oh, we're lining 25 feet, here's the price, yep. I could lose my shirt on it and it's going to take way longer than we anticipated. Yes. Yep. So in your head, we're going to be on site for four hours, but now yep. it just took us six or eight. And well, more importantly, when I yeah, when I tell the, the customer and they say, how long does it take? That's a big question we get, especially in commercial. Right. Oh, it should take a half a day, but we didn't factor those in or you didn't communicate with those or because we didn't do a walkthrough or I didn't check out the logistics, I'm now giving you wrong information and setting you up to be frustrated with us as the contractor not delivering what I promise. Exactly. So physically seeing the pipe in person and conducting our own camera inspection is a must every single solitary time. Otherwise, I, I physically cannot give you a written estimate. Exactly. Right? And yeah. I think that's And again, I don't fair. like going off other people's camera footage either because yep. I mm -hmm. like to see what I see with my own two eyes. Yeah. Know. All right. So we've we've cameraed the line. Um, we maybe created an estimate. We came in an agreement to do work with a customer and um, we're ready to show up that day. What are the steps that we're going to do on pretty much every single standard project, right? So we show up, we're ready to do the job. What's the first thing we're going to do? So first thing we're going to do is obviously get in and get set up. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the guys will actually see, you'll show, you'll see, we show up there with you know, 120 feet worth of rig mm -hmm. showing up. So it's a lot of equipment that ends up on site. Uh, we essentially have two teams of guys, one set of guys for lining, one set of guys for cleaning. Mm -hmm. So the first thing the guys are going to do is sometimes if they need to create the access pit. Mm -hmm. So they're going to either saw cut a small section of the floor inside your basement or in your driveway, wherever it may be. Um, they'll dig down and gain access to that pipe. From there, we're going to begin that descaling process or cleaning process of the roots. Okay, good. Let's stop there. We've used the word descaling. If people don't know what that means. So tell me about the prep, right? So I think the prep is the next step of right. the project. So yeah. we've maybe opened the hole. Maybe we don't need a hole. We've taken all of our measurements. We're ready to start to get into the pipelining work. Right. And like I say, what like any construction project, we need to prep that pipe first. 
Yes. Before we can put a liner. You can't just take a pipe that's really nasty and put a liner in it because guess what? The liner is going to be pretty nasty too. Exactly. And so that prep is usually descaling and jetting. So give me really dumb down terms. What the heck is descaling? What is the piece of equipment and what does it do? So for the descaling process, we use the the MIDI Miller from Pocope. Okay. Okay. Which essentially is a high speed drain cleaning machine. Mm-hmm. It's sophisticated equipment comes from Europe. Um, and what that machine allows us to do is it is a sheathed machine, so we can actually run our camera side by side with it. Okay, what does that mean? So what it means is a standard drain cleaning machine, if you were to send a camera next to mm-hmm. it, it's not sheathed. It's just the cable. So it's a cable spinning. It's a cable right? spinning within a, within a sleeve. Mm-hmm. So this way here, if our camera's running next to it, the camera doesn't get affected or damaged. Gotcha. So you can you can literally hold on to this sleeve yes. and have this thing spinning at a very high RPM and it's not going to hurt us. Exactly. So it's, it's safe and comfortable and we can actually... We need to see right. what we're doing. We talk about the medical world and the arthroscopic scope and the camera. Yeah. You got to think your pipes under the ground, under your basement floor, eight feet deep, out twenty feet. We how how do we fix it? We need to be able to see it, right? right. Yeah. So that descaling equipment. So what's on the end of that machine is um, a series of carbide chains. So we use what we call the original chains. In mm-hmm. um, those there, that's the first chain we use. So we set it to, to the specific spacing that we need mm-hmm. to make sure that we're cleaning your four, six, eight, ten, whatever size pipe appropriately. Yep. Those chains have carbide tips on them. Mm-hmm. So they're going to spin, like you said, at that high RPM down that pipe. We do roughly five or six passes on this. Mm-hmm. This way here, again, with all of our tape marks that we talked about before with the camera. So this way here, we know, all right, there's 50 feet of cast iron. We're going to descale out our 50 feet. Mm-hmm. After we do the original chains on there, then we switch over to what we call a cyclone. So this is a chain that is specifically engineered to go to the original inside diameter of what mm-hmm. that pipe should have been. Yep. So in the 4-inch, we will run 4-inch chains, and in 6-inch, we will run 6. That is what's going to create that gun barrel smooth effect on the inside of that pipe. Yep. Now, if we run into a pipe that has a trench in it, mm-hmm. we have a tool for that. Or a hole. A hole. Because mm-hmm. sometimes what will happen is a chain will hang up in those holes. Mm-hmm. So we then have a tool called the spider. Okay, it's got all these legs on it. Mm-hmm. And that is literally engineered again so that it stays in the center of that pipe and will not fall into that crack, will not hang up, will not give you any further damage to that cast mm-hmm. iron. After all that descaling process is done, just imagine you've just chipped paint off your house. It's all just laying on the ground, mm-hmm. right? Now you've got to get rid of it. Yep. So for us, the best way to do it is to jet that out. Okay. What's a, what jet? What do you mean? What's jet? So jet is basically a high-powered pressure washer mm-hmm. with specially designed nozzles that only pull back towards us. Okay. Okay. I've seen guys jet out lines and they try to jet scale and sludge and they try to push. With a jetter, all that power is designed to shoot backwards. Mm-hmm. So it's designed to pull towards you. Yep. So what we'll do again with our cameras, we'll shoot that jetter down to the end of that run and watch it with that camera and pull all of that scale and debris back towards us. Yep. At that particular pit, we either have a vac system set up, mm-hmm. which is a uh, it's a basically a barrel system. Mm-hmm. It's an oversized shop vac. Big fancy vacuum. Big fancy shop vac. Or if it's a larger scale job, we'll actually have a septic pumper truck come out, mm-hmm. and we've made a manifold for that. So this way here, if we know we've got a lot of scale and a lot of debris, we've done 300 feet at an Amazon building before, mm-hmm. and we got to make sure we get out all that scale and all that rust. Yep, and that's an even a bigger fancy vacuum that's on a truck. Exactly, and yeah. that can handle the volume of the water as well that we're mm-hmm. putting down. Once we've done that and we've jetted it out, we again do a camera inspection Mm -hmm. to make sure every inch of debris is out of that pipe. That pipe now at this point here should be perfect, round, and clean. Yeah. So where if, could I use an analogy of like sandpaper or sanding a floor? Yes. Right? So when somebody sands something, you're going to start with the rough grit. Yep. Right? Say we're refinishing the floors in your house. Yeah. You're going to get up most of that nasty stuff. Then you're going to go, you know, you're going to start at a 40 grit and then go to 80 and then the 120 into 220, right? right? So we're finely tuning or sanding or getting rid of all that nasty stuff that's in the pipe. Exactly. And really, but but we're not taking it out yet. We're just loosening it. Right. And then the pressure washing or the hydro jetter right. is our way to get the stuff out of the pipe. Because imagine we got all the nasty stuff loose and we just left it there. Right. What That's not going to, you're going to have all these, the bottom of your pipe is going to be all bumpy, right? right. Exactly. So we've got to get all that stuff out. So. Whenever we um, are prepping, they're really, for us, we do this two separate line items, but they're really in tandem. It is descaling and getting rid of the nasty crap. Right. And then hydro jetting or pressure washing and getting the nasty stuff out of the pipe. Yeah. What, ha- what would happen? Like, what if we just didn't do that? What if we just put a liner in? So we call lipstick on a pig. So essentially, if we were to line over this wall right here, you're going to get that shape. Mm-hmm. Whatever shape is there is what you're going to get. Yep. So if you don't do it, and also it's not giving a good a good surface to really bond to, yes. you know, and lock itself into. Mm-hmm. Um, again, liners are going to make 
liners are going to take the shape of whatever is there. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a rough pipe that's not properly descaled, I'm going to tell. Yep. You know, I'm going to know if I send my camera down, like, hey, I've had a line before, I'm going to know the guys didn't do the prep work properly sure. to get yep. it in there. Yeah. We, so on that camera, you can see, we can show you what a really good line pipe looks like and what a pipe that's wasn't prepped properly. Or maybe, you know, maybe they couldn't. Maybe there's an area that was so bad that they couldn't. Right. And we've had areas where our liner is not as smooth as we want because something funky was going on today. Right. But again, like any construction project, you would never paint your house. Hopefully, you wouldn't paint your house without prepping it. you got to uh -huh. get all the old paint off. You're just wasting your money. You couldn't asphalt your driveway without removing or prepping the old asphalt. You can't go over it. Right, because it's, it's not, just going to take whatever shape stick, is there. Right? right? And so the prep process is really, really important. And, and like a lot of jobs, that usually can take the most time. Of course. Right? For us, well, inserting a liner or shooting a liner is the easiest part of the job usually. And especially once you hit start on that UV. That's exactly. So it's all the stuff building up to it to get the line ready right. to go. Okay, so we've we've cameraed the line multiple times. Mm -hmm. We've cleaned the line with this cool descaling machine and these fancy chains and sand it, sanded it. We've jetted it and we've got it all nice and clean. What's the next step? So the line's prepped. What are we doing next? So the next step we're going to do is take our final measurements mm -hmm. for our line. So we're going to triple check, right? Triple check. <laughs> yeah, we, everything's, I mean, we camera this pipe more than anything. Our yes. rigid cameras get used and abused. Yeah, so if, you know, from the time that we met them on the property originally and, and did an inspection, and we give them an estimate, and now maybe we're at the job three, four hours, and we got the pipe clean. How many times do you think we've cameraed that pipe? That camera's been I, in and out of that pipe. Probably eight or nine times. Mm -hmm. Yep. So now at this point here, we're getting our final hard measurement yep, for our liner Triple cycle. checking. Yep. And we're also marking out any what we call reinstates. Okay. What so, is a reinstate? So reinstatement, if you think about 95, mm -hmm. and you got on ramps and off ramps, yep. that is, so you're driving down, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden your washing machine comes in. Okay. Then you drive a little further down, and your next bathroom ties in. Those are exits. Those are exits. Mm -hmm. Those are your reinstates. Okay. Essentially, that liner is going to blank off all of those. Yep. So we need to go in there and A, get hard measurements on our camera, again, mm -hmm. with our electrical tape, different colors, and a notepad and write everything down. Mm -hmm. This right here will show us where those connections are. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about a clock, we also mark out, hey, that's a four-inch reinstatement at 12 o'clock, yep. or that's a two-inch reinstatement at three o'clock. Yeah. So where that connection or that offer on ramp comes into your pipe, mm -hmm. right? So it could drop in at the top of the pipe, right? could drop in the side. It doesn't usually drop in underneath because that's not how water flows. Right. So it's usually... Three o'clock, if we're looking at the clock, it's ideally 12 o'clock. Right. Three o'clock, nine o'clock, or somewhere in between. Exactly. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And what that now allows us to do, so when we go to do our reinstatements, we have a hard measurement and a hard count. Mm -hmm. So now we want to make sure in your commercial property, we've hit every reinstatement mm -hmm. that's there. We also want to know the size of them, because this here will determine what size head we're going to use to cut that out with mm -hmm. and how much time it's going to take to cut these out. Yep. At the last job we just did for Burke Distribution, we had 11 reinstatements. Mm -hmm. The reinstating took longer than the cleaning and the lining process, yep. so just to get make sure we got them all dialed in. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, too, is those reinstatements, 90% of the time, you will see them dimple when the liner is pressurized in. Mm -hmm. So you will actually see like a little bit of air pressure behind that, you know, pushing that liner in a little bit. But that camera mark and that tape mark allows us to be 100% certain we hit everyone. Yeah. Yep. All right. So the line's prepped. How do you, what do, how do you put a liner in? What, what is that? So after we've made our size, mm -hmm. we take the, we go out to the trailer, we cut your liner to size. We do all okay. of our marks. We then do our impregnation. How process. does the liner come? Liner comes in a spool. Okay. So like a we, big roll. A big roll. Big roll about 350 feet. It looks like a big fire hose. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we get about 330 feet on a roll. So we'll take that out of the trailer. We'll measure it out, cut our sizes. Um, then what we do is create an end cap on it, which is a bit more in depth. That's, that's more, too complicated to explain. Don't worry about that's that. That's more technical for our guys. Yep. So we get mm -hmm. that all dialed in. Then what we do is we put a vacuum on one end of the liner. That's going to remove all the air from inside that liner and only allow annular space for that resin to fill it. Okay. What's resin? So resin is what is actually what we're curing in that pipe. Mm -hmm. um, so we will dump in roughly a pound per foot on standard residential sizes, mm -hmm. four-inch pipe. Yep. Um, and we will pour that inside the liner. This is the liquid. The liquid that goes that into the liner. That is going in the fancy tube sock that's your liner. Exactly. Right? So again, this sock is just like a felt tube sock. Think of a really long sock. Right. So that's not what's going to harden. Right. We have to pour this really cool liquid that we use an analogy of like a fancy, really fancy high-end epoxy floor paint or these cool epoxies for these tables those are liquids and resins and this is like this is a very formulated chemical right that we buy from our manufacturer specifically designed for the pipelining world this chemical is not used for anything else right 
It's specifically to become the inside of your new pipe. Exactly. And so we literally take a bucket and we pour it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From there, the vacuum will remove the air and help pull that resin all the way down. Yep. We then put it on what I call our roller table on the inside of the trailer, and a lot of people never get to see this happen. Yes, because usually the doors are closed. You know, the doors are closed because we can't have any sunlight in there yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. So this is all like behind the scenes kind of stuff. Yep. Um, from there, it goes to what we call a calibration roller. So mm -hmm. this is going to pinch that liner to the exact manufactured required thickness that it needs to be. So we want to end up with a uh, four and a half mil on the material we typically use on a daily basis. So your liner ends up being about four and a half mils thick mm -hmm. on the inside of that pipe. Once it goes through that roller, we then load it into our drum. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our lining drum is what you're going to see us roll onto the job. It's a big black drum. It's got the Royal Flush logo on it. It's got a big cone on it with mm -hmm. all these extra weird fittings on there. That is your liner on the inside there. Yep. Now, again, the whole time we are touching the outside of that liner, mm -hmm. our hands are not getting sticky or gross because that resin is on the inside. Yep, we poured it inside the tube socket. Exactly. So now mm -hmm. when we get it down to your basement, we are all set up and we're staged and ready to go. We add what we call air to it. Okay. We have a big, huge air compressor on our truck. That is actually turning that tube sock inside out. Mm -hmm. Well, we so, use the word inverting. Is inverting, the term. correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. So now you have that liner that is inverting down that pipe. Mm -hmm. That sticky resin that was once on the inside is now sticking to the wall of the pipes, mm -hmm. and it's very smooth and dry on the inside of that mm -hmm. pipe. So from there, we'll add that air pressure and get that liner all the way in and around all your bends right down to the end. And this is what we call shooting the liner. Shooting the right? liner. Yep. Yep. Our drum, the cone, we're shooting it with air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, no two shots are the same. Nope. I could shoot five shots around one bend, and they're all going to give me a different result. Mm -hmm. So the liner we're using, that Max Flex 4D, it takes all those turns and transitions really nice, transitions out to a different pipe diameter. And once it's at the end there, we now do another inspection, but this time here with our UV system. Okay, what is U what the heck is a UV system? So UV is a, uh, it's we from Speedy Light is a system we got, and it's got a UV curing head on the end of it. So it's what got does a UV stand for? Ultraviolet light. Okay, so this light lights up blue when it's on. Mm -hmm. But on the end of this system here, there's a camera, there's a light. It senses temperature, pressure, and all this kind of good stuff. So we will push that down your liner, mm -hmm. and it will air it up, and we will watch that liner stretch to get the nice perfect round shape. As we're pushing it down, we're again inspecting it to make sure there's no wrinkles or no flaws, and it's turning those bends nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. When we get down to the very end of it, and we know we're there because we have what we call in our, our end cap, so mm -hmm. we know that we're at the end of that pipe. We turn off the lights for the camera, and we hit start on that UV system. Mm -hmm. We have a specifically geared chart so that we know on the thickness of the liner and the size of the pipe we're lining, how fast and what size head we're using, how fast that light head will automatically begin curing. Yep. So now from there, it's a watch and wait game. Mm -hmm. So we're watching air pressures, and we're watching temperatures while this motor is engineered, and it's pulling back that light head at the perfect speed mm -hmm. to make sure that that liner is cooked to precision. Yep. So we don't have any flaws. This is where the 99.9% .9 success rate comes in. Mm -hmm. Because once we hit start, that liner is cooking. Yep. We know once that liner, once that light hits that liner, it's cooking in that spot in, in instantly. Mm -hmm. This is that chemical reaction that we talk about. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So that resin and that fancy little paint we talked about that we're pouring into our liner yeah. will not dry, will not harden, will not cure unless it's hit with ultraviolet light. So sunlight mm -hmm. or the UV head. Yep. And so this is what we think is a little different from us. Not every uh, lining contractor across America uses ultraviolet light. Right. Uh, and so why do we like this really cool machine? What are the other, like how do other people cure liners? So we used to cure with hot water system mm -hmm. or ambient, which is how a lot of guys cure, or they use steam. Okay. So what those resins are is... They're, they're the second you start mixing, your clock starts. Mm -hmm. And a variation in temperature of 5 degrees can cut your, your working time, we'll call it, your time that you're allowed to use it before it has to be inflated and stretched out. Uh, it could cut that in half. So with our UV system, you'll notice our guys are very low stress. Mm -hmm. Everyone's very cool, calm, and collect. They're firing a liner down. It could take two hours to get that liner down the pipe. None of us are stressed about it. If we were using ambient or hot water or steam-cured resin, and it took us two hours, we might as well throw that liner away or start digging that floor. Because mm -hmm. that liner, by that point there, is already cooked and started to have an issue. Yep. So we went the UV method because it's like a 99.9% .9 success rate. Mm -hmm. Unless my UV head doesn't turn on or that liner like t gets a tear in it on the way through, that liner's not happening in that particular moment in time. Yep. But once that light is on and that thing is cooking, it is ready to rock and roll. Well, I remember a job we did where there were some major issues, and we came back the next day and took the liner out. Yes. 
And so that was, um, the liner was in the pipe under the floor, and there were a lot of other issues that came up, and we had, to, we had to change. We had to change the project, which was fine. But because that really cool chemical we use is only activated by ultraviolet light, we actually left it in the pipe. And we came back a whole nother day later and pulled it out. Yeah. With any other resin or technology, you couldn't do that. Right. What we would have done is dug up and jackhammered the whole entire building. In that or we'd sit there with a dam cutter for quite the amount of time and start breaking it up. Um, okay, so we've got the pipe in. We've shot it down the line. We're starting to cure it. Um, what is this fancy UV machine? I mean, you just it's a computer, right? It's just a really yeah. cool computer. Yeah. So this computer, I mean, it's Speedy Light. We got it from you know PRT down in New Jersey. Um, the, and basically, this system here is designed. In, I believe it's built in Spain, mm. is where the machine's actually from. And it is. It's got all different sizes of heads. So like everything we talk about, the chains is all different sizes. There's extra small. I don't know how they label extra small, small, medium, and large mm -hmm. on these UV UV heads. And what I like about the system is it's adaptable. So we can actually, you know, have different size heads. We can rent different size heads, but each head will cure at a different speed or a different process. Mm -hmm. So the more light diodes you have, the faster it's going to cook. Mm -hmm. But now those more light diodes is a bigger head. Yep. I mean, I would love to pull, the, push down an extra large head and 90% of these pipes and cure them at eight feet a minute, mm -hmm. but it's not going to fit in a three or four inch pipe. Yep. So, mm -hmm. um, so this UV system, but again, it's, it's all data and engineered and the guys at Max Signer have done all their own research based on their liner and their resin. And we get those charts updated all the time. That'll tell us how many feet per minute yep. those lot, those heads are engineered mm -hmm. to cook at. Exactly. So this way here, we all know we're all set. Yep. Yeah. So we just, you know, it's, um, it's just setting a computer program. It's, yeah. we've got a four inch pipe and we've got this head on it and you set it to the speed and it's not set it, forget it, but it is. It is, yeah. And then we're just watching and supervising and making sure that head is pulling back at the right speed, mm -hmm. that it has enough time that those lights are saturating that chemical and turning it to a rock. Exactly. And so, okay, we've done the 50 feet and the head's ready to come out, right? We're outside of the pipe now. Right. And we see the cool blue light. Um, what do we do next? So from there, if we have reinstates, mm -hmm. then we have to send that fancy Dan Cutter down. Okay, what is a Dan Cutter? So a Dan Cutter is a robotic reinstatement cutter, okay? Mm -hmm. um, each portion of the Dan Cutter has bladders that are designed to do something different, okay? It's a very fancy robot. Okay, it's going to go down the pipe. It's got the ability to move the head up and down, mm -hmm. to spin around 360 degrees. It can inch in six inches in, six inches back. Um, and it also has a water system to clean the lens of the camera. So that cutter there is designed to go in and grind out those reinstatements. Those exits on the highway. Exactly. Right. So now with our, again, with our tape mark and the ability to see the dimples with this Dan cutter, we mm -hmm. can triple double check everything with our cameras. We send the Dan cutter down and we say, okay, there's a four inch clean out at 12 o'clock. That head will come right up and it will buzz that one out. And again, this is, if you ever see Chris do it, it's basically playing Atari. Yep. So it's a little robot with joysticks. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's probably one of the funner parts to do the job. Once we've done all of our reinstatements, we're good to go. We do again, a last inspection. Mm -hmm. So this way here, we can say to the customer, okay, here's your final product at this point. Okay, this is the line, it is cleaned, it is reinstated, and this is how smooth and perfect it looks. Mm -hmm. So we're doing another camera inspection. Another camera inspection mm -hmm. again. Yep. And then after that, we would reconnect the piping underneath the floor or at the stack, wherever it may be, backfill and cement the grade, and essentially begin wrapping up all of our equipment. Mm -hmm. Yep. And now, is there, like, is there more work that needs to be done? Is That's it? The pipe's fixed now? Your pipe is fixed, and it, it can be used. The second we reconnect those pipes, whether we backfill that hole or not, that pipe is ready to be put back mm -hmm. in service. Yep. So this is the benefit to those restaurants. This is the benefit to those hospitals. The second we reconnect, the water's back on, get going. Yep. So it's not, you've got a 24-hour wait period, you've got a 10-hour mm -hmm. wait period. You, it's yep. none we of that. You have to wait for it to dry. Think exactly. of paint. Maybe you can't come back till two or three days from now, or, right. you know, We've poured, a lot of people have gotten new driveways or poured new concrete pads where you're like, oh, yeah, I mean, it's hard, but you can't park a vehicle on there. you got to wait a week. Right. This product is instantaneous. And there's no second coat. There's yep. no, we got to reapply. There's mm -hmm. no sealant. There's, it's yep. literally, it's ready to rock. Yep. It's ready to roll. So when we're done and when we leave there, unless we have other pipes to do, another section of pipe, yeah. that is permanently fixed, ready to go, ready to be used. Ready to go. Yeah. So when we, you know, if we do a residential job, here's what we tell everybody. Do your morning routine before we arrive. Hopefully you're taking showers. I don't know. Some yeah. people don't. Yeah. Uh, you know, do your dishes the night before, but when we get on site, no water can be used. Yep. Right? We can't have people flushing toilets, running sinks, doing dishwashers while we're there because we're in that pipe. Yes. 
And by the time you get home from work, or by the time we leave, that's it. You're fixed. So now you come home for dinner, and it's as if we were never there. Exactly. You can flush your toilets, run your sinks. You can maybe take that shower that you skipped in the morning. Right. And go back to business, and you are permanently fixed. Yep. So when we talk about time and that lack of disruption, that is, in my opinion, the biggest factor that we can offer people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is the the speed of that. So we, we went through that process. And somebody who's listening who's never heard of it, maybe interested in it, you know, Mark and I actually just dumbed it down. But it still probably sounds really, really technical. And it is at some points. But it's also really simple. We've did all that. And 99% of residential jobs are done in four, six, eight hours. Right. One day. Yeah. You're fixed. When we do commercial projects, most of the time we're doing things in stages or phases. So mm-hmm. let's just say maybe we've got three different pipes or maybe we've got a 300 foot of pipe. We're going to maybe address, you know, the first 100 feet on day one, maybe the second 200, you know, feet on day two and the last up to 300 feet on day three. So we're, we're staging things. And so, of course, ideally, maybe we would have everything shut down for those three days, but we know that's not always realistic. Right. And so we can say, hey, listen, you know, while we're there, you'll be shut down, but we can get you back up and running at nighttime. So it's working out the logistics with the customer, with the job, figuring out what's going on and eliminating that downtime and disruption. Right. And at the end of the day, 99% of jobs, that's what's going to allow us to do business together. It's not going to be the price. It's not going to be the fact that somebody can dig it up and we're not going to dig it up. It's what is the pain point? What's the disruption to you in your business or your house or your family or your 700 units or your hospital? Right. And how much can we ease the pain of the fixing process? Yeah. And a lot of people, when we arrive on scene to do that job, mm-hmm. so when they see me pulling up in a pickup truck and our little sales camera truck, you know, I can see how that looks. You know what I mean? Oh, we're just doing a camera inspection to get the quote, blah, mm-hmm. blah. But the day we show up, I can't tell you how many times I've heard it, and they go, I can see where the value is. Mm-hmm. You see guys rolling out equipment at 100000 plus to go in and do these jobs. Mm-hmm. You've got trailers loaded with every inch of equipment these guys could possibly need. You've got you know, a prep trailer that's specifically designed for opening floors, descaling pipe, jetting and cleaning, and ready to go. Mm-hmm. Then you have that whole lining rig that's got everything from dan cutters to UV heads to spare parts to this and that. Everything is literally showing up on site. We don't have any real stock in our shop. Everything is in these trailers. Yep. So again, we're showing up there, and I joke about it, but there's about 120 feet of rig that's going to show up to your job. Mm-hmm. And you've got four to five guys that are going to show up there that are these technically trained guys mm-hmm. that all are professionals at their job. Yep. And if you notice on our sites, we barely talk because everybody knows their role in the job. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, you're running hoses. I don't even have to tell you that's your job. You're already doing it. Yep. You know, and then like even like we laugh, like things are being moved and cleaned up. And you'll notice, man, we're like ants the way we all work. Everyone's got a role and everything's just happening. Everybody knows what step is next, what's what's already been completed and where everything needs to go. Mm-hmm. And that's the value you see. So you guys that are all there in, in shirts and uniforms that all look appropriate. The trailers and everything are shining and cleaned and we're ready to rock. We're ready to roll. When we're there to work, we're there to work. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Hopefully, the goal of this podcast was, to, again, to give a little bit of a pipelining 101. If somebody wants to know the ins and outs, the steps of a, a project, what the real value is that what we do. But ultimately, at the end of the day, every single pipe is different. Exactly. Right? And so what we always ask for somebody and what you always say is give us the opportunity to assess an issue. Mm-hmm. There's probably a good chance that we can come up with a solution. And there's probably a good chance that we can have the opportunity to work with each other. Exactly. But sometimes there's not. Right. And so... Uh, you know, our my PSA to anybody interested or listening is if you have an issue with a pipe, give us, or if you're in North Dakota, give a local pipelining company a call. Look it up. We do exist. Our technology is out there. Give us an opportunity to solve it. And I think when you go through the options, you're going to realize that somebody like us can solve the problem quicker, faster, more permanent, with less pain. And what we do is really, really cool. Yeah. Right? So we joke, like, we're not plumbers. No. We don't have any plumbing tools in the van. We don't look like plumbers. We don't sound like plumbers. We don't use any of the tools that plumbers use. So it's really, really different in this really cool high-end technology. So, um, Mark, unless there's anything specific else you think we missed we'd like to add? No. Yeah. Uh, Mark is, in my opinion, the most knowledgeable pipeliner, certainly in New England, that I know. And so uh, you couldn't hear it better from anybody's mouth to your ears of what we do uh, how it works. And if you have any questions, shoot us an email, message us, go on to any of our social media platforms. We'd love to chat with you about what we do if you want to talk about it. Other than that, 
Do you have another thing? One more thing. If, if you're curious about it and you're not from New England or Rhode Island or Mass, anything like that, feel free to reach out to the social media pages. Yeah. Actually, I've got a wealth of network from people mm-hmm. around the country, good vendors, good contractors, people that I could definitely put you in contact with to get that solution fixed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I love being an open book. I love to talk about it. I'm, I'm always free to talk about what's going on, how the process works, and is it the right solution for your project? Mm-hmm. Feel free to reach out to all of our pages and definitely reach out. Absolutely. Great point. So thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And again, if you have any other questions about pipelining, send us a message. We'd love to talk with you about it. Thanks.